We want to welcome everybody here. Again, those of you maybe that are new, you were invited by someone to come to this service because Jimmy uh, and Sherry and Jessica are here. Welcome. It's good to have everybody here today. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Jimmy and Sherry uh, Bratcher and Jimmy's daughter Jessica here in the house with us. They have a very, very special story that they're going to share with us uh, in just a few moments. Uh, first of all, um, as I bring Jimmy to the to the platform, Jimmy Bratcher uh, is a is an outstanding blues guitarist and singer and blues musician, and, and uh, he's he's played in uh, churches as well as bars as well as concerts. Uh, he uh, he plays the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally every year, and and is open for people like the Doobie Brothers and Willie Nelson. And we're excited to, and Jimmy and Sherry are such good friends of ours. We're really, really blessed that they're in our lives. Uh, God has touched Connie and I uh, through them uh, so many times, and, and we're just excited about the friendship that we have with them. But uh, I want everyone to stand at this time, and welcome to the platform, Jimmy Bratcher. Well, it is my privilege to be here today, very special day for me, and, uh, and I hope for you too. Sherry and I are always thrilled when we, uh... okay. Thank you so much, one for you, one for Jessica. All right, I'm on extra mic. I get the extra mic. <laughs> and uh, to just to be here every time that we get a chance to come and be with you all, all y'all, and uh, and be with the Coronas. I'm trying to catch my breath right now. And uh, it's always a treat for us to be here. We do have some resources that we brought with us, some new things that uh, I just want to talk about. I have a couple of new albums that I did last year. And uh, I know I have one of them here when I was here in October last year, but this one came out after that. It's called New Old Stuff, Hymns and Gospel Songs. So you know, people don't know it, but I had a 20-year break in my music development, and that when I came to Jesus, one of the first things my pastor told me was, you got to quit playing that devil music. And so for 20 years, I felt it was more important for me to follow Jesus. Of course, he was wrong, because there's really only two kinds of music. You know what they are? Good and bad. And so these are some of the songs that we used to sing in some of my old songs. There's some hymns on here, uh, Bad Religion, a version of Bad Religion, and Dr. Doctor on here. So that's there. I released this also last year. It's called, This is Blues Country, Classic Country Songs in Blues Style. And so a bunch of songs from Hank Williams and Marty Robbins and Buck Owens and the Buckaroos. And I rearranged those to... Uh, to my format, so kind of a blues rock style. And then just a few months ago, Sherry and I finished a book. And uh, it looks like a hippie kind of book, doesn't it? And it's called Granny Paid for Our Divorce. And if you all know my story, you know mine and Sherry's story, you know that we were married. Look at that. I'm walking around like I'm drunk. I'm drunk in the spirit, I'm telling you right now. And... Uh, and so um, this is a book about our story. So if you want encouragement in your relationship, you know, because we went all the way to the divorce court, and actually we got in a fight one night that I lost, and Connie's laughing already. And three days later, after having reconstructive surgery on my face, my grandmother agreed to pay for our divorce. And so this book will encourage your relationship. It's a good tool for you to give to people that are struggling in their relationships. It's easy read. It even has pictures. And so don't take your dreams to the grave. I've had this here several times. We have some teaching series out on the table. This one's called The Marriage of Your Dreams. It's an in-depth teaching into marriage and some of the things that Sherry and I have learned. And then finally, there's a DVD out on the table of the story that we're going to tell you today. The little girl wins. So all that stuff's out there, and if you'd like to buy it, it will help us to be able to do what we do. You know, we have the opportunity every year to be in all kinds of 
non-church venues and prisons. Uh, we have a big prison tour that we do every year in June, and uh, we have some dates coming up in December where we'll be in prison uh, during Christmas, because Christmas is the hardest, most difficult time for men and women to be incarcerated, because you can imagine being uh, alienated from your family by your own faults and your own mistakes, and it's Christmas, and you got nobody. So we do a big outreach. Uh, I can't remember the date this year. Uh, I think it's like the 19th or something, and we'll be in a prison in central Kansas. They will have prepared 950 gifts to give to the men that are there, and it's an incredible time. And so when you buy this stuff, when you give in the offering, that's what helps us to be able to take those opportunities that don't pay us. And, you know, I always want to be involved, and I always want to be going places where people can't pay me because that keeps my heart in the right place. I want to be giving to people. And that's why when we go to Sturgis, we give away thousands of Bike Blessing CDs. And we want that seed to be sown into people's lives where they don't pay for it because the gospel shouldn't be paid for by anyone. It should be free to everyone. And we don't need to put a price on it. So anyway, we're here today and we're going to tell you a story. So this will be... Uh, this right here will be standard equipment for today. So I'm just warning you in advance, if you don't like to see men cry, well, then you probably should leave now because I will try to contain myself as much as possible. But this story hits right at the very core of my life. It's not very often that you're going to go to a church service where someone is going to be as honest and as raw as I am going to be today. Some people don't like it, they're not comfortable with it. But really, overall, I've been thinking about this for a long time. As a Christian, we're not really very honest with ourselves or with each other. And we need to be more honest and we need to be safe for each other. So, so anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we have this opportunity. Lord, guide me and Jessica to tell this story in such a way that it opens people's hearts to be honest with themselves, that they see the reality of forgiveness and redemption in action. And Lord, that those that need to make a move on these things themselves, Lord, that it would cause them to be aware and give them faith and encouragement to do so. Lord, I pray today that those that are here that don't know you would be moved towards knowing you. God, that they would take a step in the direction of you. Lord, and today make a decision to believe on you by faith in what Jesus did for us all. And Lord, I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in 1971, I was a selfish, out-of-control 17-year-old. The one thing that I had, that I lacked in my life that my parents never gave me, I had great parents, but the one thing that they never did was discipline me. And so I was completely self-absorbed and totally out of control. I started using drugs about the age of 13. By the time I was 17, I had, my drug of choice was LSD. I had respect for two things in my life, only two things. That was JB Rare Scotch and heroin. Those were the only two things that I had any respect for. I had disrespect for everything else because it was all about me. One night, I was dating a girl off and on, nothing serious as far as I was concerned, and she came to me and she said, I'm pregnant. And to that, I chose to reject her and to accept in my own mind, deceive that the baby that she was carrying was not my own. A few years later, by the mid-80s, Sherry and I were married and we were born again and our lives were pretty settled and I was in a restaurant in my hometown and I saw this girl that I dated's dad and he was there and he had a little teenage girl about 13 or 14 with him at the time. And I saw her across the room. And she was so beautiful. And I knew that she was my child. And Sherry and I prayed and we considered and we asked ourselves, what should we do about this? And the answer that we received was, 
nothing that we should wait. And so fast forward to 2009, I'm preaching at a large church just outside of St. Louis, Missouri, and it's Father's Day. And there's a girl in the crowd, and she's so impressed with what I'm doing that she begins to communicate to her big sister. She begins to text her big sister and tell her all about this incredible service that she's in. And when she gets out of the service, she calls her big sister and she begins to tell her about this preacher that she heard. And her big sister asks, she finally says, well, tell me this guy's name. Now, this is on Father's Day. I want you to, I want you to let this soak in. This is on Father's Day. She goes, tell me this man's name because I want to look him up online. And she says, his name's Jimmy Bratcher. Her little sister hears the phone drop on the floor. And she picks up the phone and she asks her little sister, she says, do you know who this man is to me? And she says, no, he's just this guy from, preacher guy from Kansas City. And she tells her little sister, he's my dad. And for the next year and a half, her little sister would go to their mother and appeal to their mother to reach out to me. Well, that little girl that I rejected is a grown woman by now. And she's here today, and I'd like to introduce you to her. Her name's Jessica. <clears throat> hey, look at that. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. I'm not from the South either. But something happens. Yeah, something like that. So my sister is texting me, and she has no idea that the only things that I knew about my dad was I knew his name, I knew that he played the guitar, and I knew that he had long curly hair. I didn't know anything else. And so she's texting me, and he'd been telling a story about my brother praying for his daddy to come home on Father's Day. Isn't that interesting that that whole Father's Day thing kind of just keeps happening over and over again? And when she's texting me and once I realized what, who he was and that, that there was a possibility that we could be connected, my sister says, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not doing anything. He hasn't been here for all this time. Why would I care to have that mess in my life now? And that's exactly how I felt. I was so hard-hearted about the whole thing that I... I don't care what he's got. Great, he found Jesus. Whoop de doo. I mean, and that's the way. That was the attitude I had for about for about six, seven months. It kept coming up, and I kept going, mm, "Nah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need this. Don't want it. Not looking for it." So then, something shifted. So at this point, I am two years into my Christian walk. And I, my father-in-law has COPD um, from exposure to chlorine gas as a young man, and he's dying. He's in hospice, and I'm in that room, and I'm angry. And I have, you know, we have those loud moments with God. If I'd have been anywhere other than that hospice room, I'd have been screaming, and he's dying. He's literally breathing his last in front of me. My grandfather, who raised me, is almost 90. It's only a matter of time before every positive father figure I've had in my life is gone. And I tell God, why? If you're so good, why? Why would you take them from me? This is my dad. This is the only dad I've ever known. And now you're going to take him? How dare you take him from me? Who do you think you are? And he passed away. And I still put everything concerning him in a box and left it there because I wasn't dealing with it. And a year later, almost to the very day, I get a Facebook friends request from Jimmy Brutcher. 
So I'm preaching in uh, Christiana, Pennsylvania. Sherry and I are there doing a marriage seminar, and I'm doing three Sunday morning services, and I'm getting ready to walk out to preach the last service. And I hear a voice in my heart. And the voice says, I'm about to change your life. So I think of all the things that could change, like, you know, maybe Sherry and I will quit traveling, like I'll get a real job, you know, or something. <laughs> and, uh, and so we go out, I do this service, and we get in the car to um, go to the airport at Philadelphia, and I get an email from Jessica's mother, who I haven't heard from since 1971. And the email says, this is the whole email, she says, it's overdue that you should meet your daughter and your grandsons. Her name's Jessica, and you can look her up on Facebook, and she doesn't know about you yet. But obviously she knew about me. And so the first thing I did was send her a friend's request on Facebook, at which point she went into shock. Panic. So it's 2011, my marriage is not in a good place, my kids are not in a good place, things are just rough. And I get a Facebook friends request in the middle of the Daytona 500. Now that may not be significant to some of you, but my husband is a big NASCAR guy. So he's watching the Super Bowl of racing, and I'm interrupting, and I said, baby. And he said, woman. And he did. He stiff-armed me like the whole deal. We've had and talks I, about this. <laughs> since, since and I, so, I, so, so he says, woman, the race is on. And I said, but baby, this is important. And I handed him the computer because then it wasn't on my phone because that was new. And I handed him the computer and he said, isn't that your dad? I said, yep. He said, what you going to do? I said, nothing. I slammed the computer shut, I got in the truck, and I drove to town. So I had to go get something, I'm not really sure what. I'm not really sure how I got there. I'm pretty sure I couldn't see. I'm pretty sure it was by muscle memory that I drove that route. Because somehow I ended up in the parking lot at a store. I'm pretty sure I went in the store. I'm not really sure I bought anything. I don't know that I ever went back for whatever it was I was supposed to be getting. And my mom texts me and says, call me. And she says, you don't have to do anything. I said, I know. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. What do I do with this? Why does he, what does he want? And I panicked and I cried. And the whole time I start asking God, what are you doing? And he just kept telling me, you have to trust me. And what I, what I didn't say is that after that time in the hospice room, almost every sermon, every scripture, every study, every time I was alone with the Lord, he just kept reminding me, you have to trust me. You have to trust me because I have something for you. And like Dad, I went through this process of, of I wonder what it could be. And I'm thinking, I'm going to get a new car, I'm going to get a new job. I'm going to move back to Missouri. I'm going to do, like, I got this whole list of stuff that, okay, God, this is my list. But that's not what he gave me. That's not what he wanted for me. And so during the time after I sent that email or that friend's request to Jessica, I went through what I can describe as only the deepest grief that I have ever experienced in my life. Because the reality of my actions all of a sudden hit me like a ton of bricks. How in the world could I have done this to one of my children? I, I, I still don't have an answer for that. Um, and, but just living with that was more than I could really bear that I had walked off and left her. And uh, I, could only, I could only pray one prayer. I'd wake up in the morning and the first thing on my mind would be her. And I would lay on my bed, and you know, the Bible tells us that sometimes we don't have words, we just groan. Because there's things going on too deep in our hearts that we can't really express. But I managed to come up with some words, and I would just lay there on my bed every day, and I would say, Oh God, Jessica. 
And so it took her about three weeks to deal with me, with me showing up and to overcome her fears and to allow the Lord to begin to deal in her heart to trust. So I sort of alluded to a box. So when I, when I thought about any daddy things, when I had any daddy needs, when I had any daddy dreams for my whole life, they went in this box. And it was this pretty little black box with a big bright pink bow on it. And it was locked away, way down deep inside of my heart. And now God has decided to put me in this, well, no, God didn't decide to put me in this position. I was in this position, and I had to deal with that box. So for three weeks, he heard nothing. I didn't respond. I didn't reply. And for three weeks, I grieved that now I had to be something else. Because for almost 39 years, I was fatherless. I was abandoned. I was orphaned in a way. Every time there was a daddy-daughter date night or a father-daughter dance or something where daddy should have been there, there wasn't anybody. So now I have to look that in the face and address it. And what do you do with that, right? So I wrestled. I wrestled with God because what God said is give it to me. And what I said was, no, I have the right. I am justified. I can be whatever I want and I want to be angry and I want to be bitter and I want to be mad because he wasn't there for anything ever. And now he wants to be my daddy? Are you kidding? And God said, no. You said you trust me. You said you believe me. No, you don't get this. So I sent him an email. After three weeks of silence. And I told him. The little girl in me wants to run to you, arms wide open. But the woman in me wants to know where you've been. And why now? Because I dealt with you a long time ago. I knew that you would never see me dance. You would never see me graduate. You would never walk me down the aisle. I knew that you would never be there. So why now? But I'm glad you're here. And thanks for showing up. When I read the words, thanks for showing up, I knew that God was speaking to my family. Because whenever Sherry and I are asked to describe what we do, we always tell people, well, we have the ministry of showing up. You know, and the equation is Christ in us. Where we go, he goes, and where he goes, stuff happens. And so I read those words, and I, I was at Daytona that day. We just finished doing concerts at Daytona Bike Week, and I was sitting across from the Daytona Speedway when I got that email. And I went back to the house we were staying at. We were staying at a house with a, an old biker dude that had a nice house and no furniture. And so we were, all we had was an air mattress. That was it. But uh, I took the next five hours to try to write a response. It was the most important and significant email that I had ever written. And I wanted to be sure that I was honest, and I wanted to be sure that my words were directed by the Lord. And, and so I took plenty of time. All I had was my phone, and I had to write it on my phone. And, but something that she said in the email. So I explained where I'd been and why now, and I did my best not to make any excuses, but to take responsibility for my actions and to also take responsibility for my actions from this time forward. When I closed my email, I referred back to her email. She said that the little girl in her was, will, was ready to run into my arms. 
And I close my email by simply saying, Jessica, I hope that the little girl wins. And so that started a flurry of emails and texts. We didn't talk on the phone, we didn't have any verbal communication, just emails and texts, all of which that I've kept and, uh, and cherish. We're writing a book, all of those will go in a book to really, so that you could read the actual words that were used to bring reconciliation into our lives. And so Sherry and I were in Florida on the East Coast and Jessica lives on the East Coast. And so we, I just mentioned, I said, if you would like to meet my wife and I, we would, we, you just pick out the place and the time and we'll be there. And several days later, she finally said, okay, on Monday, March 14th, in Charlottesville, Virginia, we'll have dinner at this restaurant and we'll meet. Now at this point, I have started to tell people. Only people that were close to us, I have started to tell a little bit more. And the stories that start coming out of the woodwork are horrific. Of people who have tried to reconcile with their families, a parent or as a parent to a child, and how disastrous it has been. I had one guy tell me that, don't tell him where you live, don't let him meet your kids, don't show him any pictures because I had to get a restraining order against mine because he stole my identity after we met. Like these are the stories, and it's constant. Every conversation, oh, well, I heard this story about. And everything that was happening in that point was contrary to God saying, trust me. Everything that could possibly hit me to pull me away to say, no, I'm not going to do this, constantly bombarded me. But I wasn't willing to give it up. I just knew that this was something that God had for us. And so, on March the 14th. We found this restaurant and we pulled into the parking lot and there was her and her husband. Now her husband has the biggest pickup truck ever made and known to mankind. And his name is Leroy Strong. First Sergeant, retired Marine Corps drill instructor of the year, Leroy Strong. And I figure he's packing. Tell him about what the Lord spoke to you while you were standing there waiting for us. You remember how you looked in your heart? So we were standing there and I was trying to figure out what was I going to do because I had no idea. I was so stressed out, so freaked out, so uneasy and unstable and so on such in such unfamiliar territory I had no idea what I was going to say or what I was going to do and the whole time I kept going back to being justified in my anger and justified in my all the reasons there could be for me to say no and hold him at arm's length and I wanted it I wanted it and God kept saying no you don't get to have this you don't get to be angry you don't get to be bitter you don't get to be you don't let, get to let that toxicity stay in your heart. You've got to let it go. You've got to let me have this because I want to give you something more. I want to give you something beautiful. I'm beautiful. <laughs> and you're nice. <laughs> and he said, you can't have those things. Nope. But can't, you can have your daddy. Can't have those things, but you can have your daddy. And I remembered in that moment, that prayer in hospice. And at that moment that they pulled up in the biggest hippie van I have ever seen. <laughs> but they pulled up and I knew that God was answering my prayer. So who's going to be my daddy now, I said. And God said, he is. And so we got out, and I had made up my mind. I'm not going to say the first words. I'm going to be quiet until she speaks, because I've never heard her voice. And you as parents know how it is when your kids first start speaking and how significant that is. And I never had that opportunity. 
And I tell people all the time, it's like, I don't use words like hi or hello in a greeting, because I'm too cool for that. <laughs> you know, I'll do something like, hey. <laughs> and so I'm convinced I'm going to be quiet until she says something. And so Sherry and I get out of the van, and we're standing there. And, and I walk up to her, and I'm just... I can't believe it because she looks just like me, except she's more beautiful. I'm beautiful. She said I was beautiful. I want you all to document that. And so we're standing there, and I'm waiting for her first words. Hey. I'm a hugger. I'm a hugger. And for probably what seemed like forever, probably about 20 minutes, we just stood there and wept. And we went into the restaurant, and it was crowded and noisy. And it's the loudest restaurant in Virginia. And I, to, and I said to her, I said, you know, we don't really want anything from you. We're not going to ask you for anything. It's, that's not why we're here. And I said, but, you know, I'm not going to even ask you for this, but sometime... I'm going to ask if you would. Would you forgive me? In, in that moment, I knew there was only one answer to that statement. And I reached across the table, and I grabbed his hand, and I said, we can't change the past, but you're here now, and we're cool. That's my girl. <laughs> We're cool. And so we started a journey together. And uh, of, of what I can say is absolutely remarkable. You see, I, I, I told the guys yesterday, you know, I, I'd figured that I qualified for the blessings of God on my life the day that I received him forward in my life, which was December 19th, 1976. But I had no idea that God had the ability to reach back into my past to a time when I didn't know or serve him and to redeem that which I had rejected. And the Lord said, Jimmy, I've been faithful to your seed even when you weren't. And so we began a journey and that journey, you know, included other people. One of the biggest miracles in our journey is sitting on the front row. That's right. And her name's Sherry. I've heard countless stories of stories of ours where families weren't reconciled because one spouse or the other said, you're not bringing another child into this home. I will not share you with someone else. But Sherry... She, said this, she said. She welcomed me like I was her own. But Sherry told me, she said, you know, Jimmy, we have a great life. We have a great marriage and we have a great family. But something's always been missing. And Jessica, Leroy, and their four boys are it. What about my kids? Our kids, Jason and Amanda, I have a picture. If we could show that picture, I just like, I meant to do this when we started, but I forgot. So here's our family. Amanda, she works for us, and uh, she works for our ministry and has since 2002. Jason, he lives in Dallas, and he's a chef. And Jessica. So our first church service together we got to meet the boys, you know, four boys that are grown, you know. It's not likely they're going to call us Grammy and Pops, but they do. But they do. So on our side of things, it was so natural, it was ridiculous. You just can't, you can't make it up, Right. So my husband, as he talked about, is the Marine's Marine, right? So security conscious always, first and foremost. 
after dinner says, hey, let's go back to the hotel with him and we'll sit and talk. And we stayed until the wee hours talking. And then he says, why don't you invite him up to the house so they can meet the boys? Now, at that time, my husband was working in Charlottesville and I live in, we live in Maryland and he wasn't going to be there. So my super security conscious husband says, yeah, it's okay, you can take them. So we walk into the church that we were attending at the time so that they can meet the boys. And as we walk in, his first glimpse of my firstborn is him standing on a stage playing a guitar on a worship team for the youth group. And then Grammy and Jacob get in trouble for giggling during prayer. (laughs) And it was like, we fast forward to Our our first Father's Day. And we're at the house, and everybody else is still in bed. And I come downstairs, and I'm so excited. Like, I feel like a five-year-old on Father's Day. And I've got this coffee mug full of my favorite candy bar. Was it Easter? Yeah. So zero candy bars, if anybody knows what that is. Those are best candy bars ever. Yeah, they're my favorite candy bar. But she didn't know that. I didn't know that. favorite candy bar. And I give him this coffee cup with daddy names all over it. And the thing that just would not leave me was that it was like he was always a part of our lives and God reached into our hearts and took out any void my children wouldn't let me have regret I tried to hang on to being regretful and they attacked me like a pack of wild dogs that's right (laughs) said you can't have that how dare you think you can have that and go forward in this relationship but you know, we share this story with you because we've met so many people that are like us. They come to us and they say, well, I'm Jessica, or I'm Sherry, or I'm Jessica's mom, or I'm you. And you know, what we found is that there's this fear that surrounds us from trying to reach out and trying to connect and trying to reconcile. The Bible tells us that we have the ministry of reconciliation. That's our business, and who more should we be reconciled with than our families? And so we we tell you this message today because we just want to ask you, if that's you, we want to ask you to do something. Now, for some of you, what you should do is nothing. What you have to do is hear the voice of God on the actions that you should take if you take a step forward. For some of you, you should do nothing. For some of you, you should wait for some of you you should make the call do the research and try and connect but if you're here today and you say you know I've got this loved one in my life and we're separated by our fear or by our anger or by our abandonment or our rejection or whatever the pinnacle of Christian experience is forgiveness and we need to be astute at that Because forgiveness is a cancer that rots our hearts. We retain all of that unforgiveness in our hearts and then every experience after that, we experience through the pain of that experience. And so if you're here today, I'm just going to ask that you would consider to forgive in the New Testament terms means to cut loose, to let go, to send away doesn't mean that you agree with the offender it means that you're going to take another step how about a hand for my daughter you know this story is about me being reconciled to my daughter When I was going through this experience, I'd learned so much about God's hearts and God's desires. Because he desires, as I longed to be connected to her, as I grieved for her absence in my life, so he is that way with all of us that haven't trusted him. And I know that there are some of you here in this crowd that today is a day where you find yourself not trusting the Lord. The greatest experience that you can ever have in your life is to be born again. 
What born again, what's that? You know, Jesus talked about it in John chapter 3 when he said, you must be born again. And the guy he said it to says, you know, how's that possible? You know, I can't go back into my mother's womb. And he said, no, you don't understand. This isn't something that you're going to do naturally or intellectually. This is something that has to happen in your spirit, in your heart. And when we're born again, we have this radical transformation that happens to each of us. We get a new heart. The Bible says that God reaches in and he grabs our heart that he describes as stony, indifferent, unteachable. And he pulls it out and without us missing a heartbeat, he gives us a new heart and it's soft and pliable and teachable and it has his laws written on it. We get a new nature, a new genetic. You know, one of the remarkable things that we discovered with Jessica is that she's just like me. I had no influence in her life. I mean, I had no way to influence her behavior or her actions. You know, she was up here, she would say, you know, I struggled all my life trying to figure out where I got this goofy personality. And now I know it's your fault. <laughs> and we get that nature that is like God. And God is so good and so wonderful that he sent Jesus to take away everything that would be in the way of us coming to our Father. Just like when Jessica and I connected, my heart was open, my home was open, our family was open, everything was cleared out of the way, and all she had to do was say yes. And that's God's desire for you. If you've never opened up your heart to the Father and said, Father, I want to know you. I want to be born again. It is the most incredible experience that you can ever have as a Christian, as a person. The most, the most incredible experience that you can ever have in your life is to open up your heart and receive the love of the Father into your life. And Jesus came, the incredible thing about the gospel, the good news is that Jesus came and he cleared everything out of the way. He took all of our sin on himself. He took all of the curse on himself. He took all of our pain on himself and he bore that instead of us. And God saw that and said, I'm satisfied with that. So every man that desires to know me as their father, all they have to do is like Jessica said, trust me. All they have to do, the Bible says, is believe, which is trust, in their hearts that what Jesus did is all that matters. And so could we do this? Could you all stand with me? If you're here today and you say, Jimmy, you know what? I've never, I've never been born again. Or you say, you know, I'm just not sure if I'm born again. Or if you say this, I'm disconnected from the Father. Then in just a moment, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask us to close our eyes in just a moment and say a few words and if that's you, I'm going to ask you to simply raise your hand and indicate it to me so that we can pray together. You know, the most incredible thing that, one of the most incredible things that I've ever witnessed in my life is receiving my children, them being born into our family. And just like the incredible experience of the story that we just shared with you is what God's desires are like. He's there just saying, you know, will you trust me? Will you just come to me with all, all your stuff? Don't worry about being good enough. Don't worry about having it right or saying the right words or doing any of those things. If you just come to me and open up your heart and trust me, and I'll take care of everything else. And that'll start you on a journey that after doing this for 42 years almost, I can tell you, is the most wonderful experience that I've ever had in my life. So can we do this? Can we bow our heads out of respect for each other and reverence for God? And if you're here today and you say, Jimmy, I'm, I'm not born again. 
or I've never trusted and believed on Jesus. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm just not certain. I just don't know for sure that I've done that. You know, maybe you were baptized as a child or sprinkled or confirmed or went through catechism or any of those things, but do you know in your heart that you've connected to your Father, that you've trusted what Jesus did was for you? It is the most incredible experience you can ever have in life. And if you're here today and you just say, you know what, Jimmy, I'm just, I'm just away from the Father. You know, I love that story in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. That when his father sees him after he's wasted all of his money and partied it all away, and he sees him, and the Bible says he saw him afar off, and he ran to him. That's a miracle right there, an old man running. But that's how excited he was to be reconnected to his son. And so if you're disconnected from the father, today's your day to reconnect. So if you're here today, I've asked for three people. If, you, if, you know, if you've not been born again, you've never trusted Jesus, then I want you to lift your hand. If you're unsure if you've made those decisions, then I want you to lift your hand. If you're ready to reconnect, then I want you also to lift your hands. There's only good things that are in store. So if that's you today, right now, I want you to lift your hand and we're just going to pray together. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bunch of men. Thank you, sir. All right, well, let's pray. Let's all pray together and pray out loud and say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you just as I am, a sinner. And I put my trust... In what you did, in your life, in your death, and by your resurrection. And I believe that God rose you from the dead. And I want to be born again. I want to be a new creature. I want to be a new man, new woman. And I come to you in simple faith. Believing that Jesus rose from the dead. Now let me pray for you all. Father, I pray for these that lifted their hands. And Lord, I ask right now, Lord, that they would know this moment in their hearts. That it would be so real in their senses that they would never doubt that on this day that you visited them, that you, that you saved them, that you've blessed them, that you've accepted them, that you've received them, and that they are your children. And I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Let's give these folks a hand. How about it? I've got just a, just a couple of seconds, and I just want to say this. If you're here today and you've got that family is separation issue in your life, life's too short to live it in bitterness and unforgiveness. Be courageous, be wise, be bold, but take steps to make sure that that's not the way you live your life. And I just so thank you for being here. God bless you all. Pastor Steve.